for us. We'll be in Romans chapter 6, uh, probably get through verse 1 through 11, and uh, <clears throat> see what we can learn from that. So, one thing that I want to start by saying uh, as we get into the topics of sin, forgiveness, uh, God's grace, uh, I want to establish first off, and we'll build on this concept, that that God indeed hates sin. Okay? God does hate sin. He He's proven that uh, time and time again. We know that uh, Hebrews 13 uh, teaches us that uh, Jesus Christ is the same uh, uh, yesterday, today, and, and forever. Uh, he's, he doesn't change. Okay? His qualities remain the same, and uh, I think that's true with God too. Uh, he does not change. His thoughts on sin have been consistent throughout. Uh, when it hit the time of the flood, I don't know how many people went down in the flood, but they died a tough death because of their sin. Uh, when we hit Sodom and Gomorrah, <clears throat> we saw what hit them. I mean, that's it's not even really fun to think about. Uh, all of what uh, came down, bombarded them, they were completely destroyed. God hates sin. Uh, Nahum uh, is telling the story where uh, Jonah, first off, went into Nineveh. He told him, repent, repent, repent. Nahum is several years later when they really haven't done that, and he says, Nineveh has no hope. Uh, you can go in there and read it, and it, I mean, it, it's pretty graphic, and it's God saying, this is what's fixing to hit you. You're not going to like it. There's going to be no hope for you. And it's pretty, it's pretty tough, and why would he say that? Why would he say that about, why would God say that about people? His creation, people. The sin. He cannot stand the sin, okay? Uh, the biggest evidence that I have, I've listed a couple of evidences of, of why God would hate sin, uh, but the biggest evidence I can think of is <clears throat> looking at Jesus going to the cross. His son, who should be by his side in heaven, he was there in the beginning, that's where he belongs, you know, receiving praise and glory and honor, but here he is on the earth, humans spitting on him lashing out at him uh, you know breaking his skin causing him to bleed uh, putting nails through his hands and his feet hanging him on a cross God in the flesh this is what what we did that's the biggest evidence I have where God hates sin that's that was what he had to do about it okay uh, the sin caused Jesus to be put in that position. So does God hate sin? Yeah, he does. It's a violation against his law. It's a violation against uh, his laws. It's a violation against his character, his inner being. Uh, I think God does have uh, his inner being, as we can describe it in our terms. He has that, and it's all good. Uh, so sin is, is a complete violation against that. <clears throat> So, when we get into the topic of grace and mercy and forgiveness, uh, we still can be certain that God hates sin, uh, but he's wanting to do something about it. He's wanting to draw us out of that practice. So, Romans chapter 6, verse 1, Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not, how shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? I want to talk about uh, this topic of continuation of sin. Uh, sin is not God approved. We just said that God hates sin. Uh, so I want to talk about how we can be people on the earth. You can be full of sin. Okay? We, we see how the Gentiles live. If you look into 1 Corinthians... Uh, he talks about all these lists of sins that, that the people were into. You read all the stuff that they did, and it's just like they were into a lot of bad stuff. 
And, and Paul says, and such were some of you, but you were redeemed. You were uh, cleansed of these things. You've made a change. You've repented and come to the knowledge of God. And so there's people that sin. There's, there's Paul. You can take him, for example. He sinned a lot. He was completely against God, and God brought him uh, to the knowledge of Jesus and what he wanted him to do. So any measure of sin... God can redeem that person. He can seek out that person and find them and bring them to himself. He can. He's capable of doing that and having enough uh, mercy and grace uh, in his being to forgive that person. And it's, uh, it's incredible uh, how he's able to do that. At the same time, how appropriate is it to become a Christian, you were doing all these things, you were in the world practicing immorality and sin, how appropriate is it to then become a Christian and just keep on going with the same things? This is what Paul's addressing here. This is what he's trying to cover. Can you become a Christian and just keep doing those same old things? No. no. Okay, so uh, John the Baptist was one of the first people that really uh, hit this right before Jesus came. He says that we have to uh, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. We are supposed to be baptized uh, in a, with a baptism of repentance. Repentance meaning turning away from old ways into the new ways. Uh, you can see several times uh, Jesus used the phrase whenever he was healing someone, uh, he didn't just heal them, but he said, your sins are forgiven. And they questioned, how can you say this? And he would say, uh, you know, the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. So he would heal the person, but he would also say what? Go and sin no more. Okay? Yes? Yeah, yeah, and and so we want to talk about how, okay, this is something we discussed in Hebrews, we want to talk about how a person can be uh, of the world, sinful, get baptized, but what if you make a mistake after you're baptized? Okay, we want to, want to, exactly, we want, to, we want to talk about that topic and, and what this passage is trying to suggest to us. So I want to I want to turn to 1st John uh, 1 right at about verse 6 If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not practice the truth. What type of person would do that? Someone probably that had been baptized, that did uh, try to come into the fellowship of God. They're saying, we, we say that we have fellowship, but it says they walk in darkness. What does John say about it? It says they're lying. They're not practicing the truth. They're deceiving uh, themselves. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. Okay, so you were cleansed of your sin before you were baptized, but then you're baptized. If you're walking in the light, uh, if you confess your sin, verse 9, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. One of the things we learned uh, in Hebrews, I want to turn there too, it teaches us that Jesus became a high priest. Okay? He came down. Uh, he went through the process of uh, being the high priest, but he was also the sacrifice. He was both. Uh, but where is he now? Did he? Yeah, he's with God. So he didn't come and, and do his one year's uh, uh, sentence or, or, or service like the other high priest. Jesus is an eternal high priest. Now you can look at uh, Hebrews uh, 7 and Hebrews 9. Talk about where he is now. 
Okay. Uh, we uh, we do these things in, uh, in in culture, I guess, where they they have someone that used to be really really famous, uh, maybe from a, a movie that they did a while back, and then they grow up, and it's like, where are they now? Uh, they've done a lot of those with uh, the uh, anytime there's there's like a movie like like Harry Potter, where most of the the actors are, are children. Okay, that's probably the most famous they're ever going to be when they were kids. And so we do a, where are they now? Where's Jesus now? He's in heaven. He's with God. He's still a high priest. He's still making a mediation between us and God. And so as we still have sins, we still mess up. We're still uh, fallible men and women. Okay, So we're still going to mess up. We're still going to sin. Uh, but the, the difference is, what are we walking in? The light. the light. Okay? So as we mess up, we just admit it. We tell people, I, I messed up. I, I sinned. Uh, you know, we, do we do so with any guilt? Okay? You do so with the thought of, I don't want to do that again. Okay? Our conscience tells us it was wrong. But ultimately, if I sin... I don't have to have any guilt because I, my conscience tells me that was wrong. Don't keep doing that. I ask God to forgive me, and I know I am. So at that point, I'm living a guilt-free life, even though I still mess up. Okay. So we have all those things. God wants us to walk in the light. Walking in the light is a special thing. Being sin-free is a special thing. Being guilt-free is a special thing. So my thought to you is don't deprive yourself of any of those things. Don't not walk in the light. Don't walk in darkness. Because then you're, you're back into the world. You're doing those things. Uh, don't consider yourself... Uh, as if you're not forgiven. If you're walking in the light and you're in Christ and you're asking for forgiveness, you're acknowledging your mistakes. Don't act, don't act like you're still in your sins. You're free from that. That's why, that's why when we sing a song up here, I'm all in. I want to sing. Because God forgave me. That's what's exciting about it. And so don't act like you're, you're still in your sins. And don't act like you, you have to have this burden of guilt. Because if you're walking in the light, you repent of it, you confess, you're not in a state of guilt. Shouldn't be. Okay? Uh, but burden being lifted off your shoulders. For sure. For sure. You're walking in the light. You're walking with Jesus because it is the light. For sure. I want to look at uh, Hebrews 5, uh, the, the tail end of, of the passage, verse 12. Uh, want to uh, skim through this. It says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are mature, a full age. But it's not talking about your age on the earth. It says, Here's how they describe full age or maturity. Those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to what? Distinguish good from evil. That's maturity. So you come into to Christ, you, you, you know the, the knowledge of I want to be forgiven, I want to uh, be in Christ. Uh, sounds like a good thing. But then what? How do you know what good is from evil? Getting into this all the time. Through uh, once a week it says, uh, get into it. No, it says constant use. Okay, So we're constantly referring to God's word, his will, as to how we ought to live. Uh, I mean, it mixes into every fiber of our being, uh, everything that we might go and do. And it goes way beyond these four walls. Uh, that's for sure. It goes into everything that we participate in. Oh, and God has an answer for all your questions. Yeah, for 
scripture. And so uh, it teaches you as you use it to distinguish good from evil. Uh, <clears throat> the next part leading into chapter 6, we discussed this at length. But it talks about some person coming to repentance and then they start to fall away. Well, what exactly constitutes falling away? That's what everyone wants to know. Everyone wants the big answer that, to that question. Uh, I like just skipping to verse 7 of chapter 6 because I think it almost is like a, uh, a parable that Jesus would offer uh, in, in kind of understanding this topic. It says, For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you, yes, things that accompany salvation. Okay? I think a lot of the things that especially as I was reading through some of these passages that back up Romans, I was immediately thinking of all the things that it connects to in the Gospels. Most of the letters, it's like they're just repeating what Jesus already said. In a lot of ways. There's a lot of good things that it uh, adds to and gets into and it gives us the, the details. Uh, it gives us a lot of that, but a lot of the concepts... The overall concepts, uh, they came from Jesus, and they're repeating those uh, to help us understand. This reminds me of Jesus with the fig tree. He goes up to the fig tree. It was uh, the time, uh, I guess, for uh, the figs to be pr produced, and he looked around for a, a fig on the tree. Well, there wasn't one. And he said, be gone with you. And it withered up and died immediately. And the, uh, the apostles with him were like, how did that tree wither up so fast? And they were like still questioning it, even after all the miracles he'd done. Well, he was teaching them a lesson about uh, prayer and asking, and you'll receive. But also, I think uh, it's very similar to what's being said in Hebrews chapter 6 right here. Uh, God has designed all of his creation as in like uh, trees and things. He waters them. He gives them all of the things that they need. Isn't he doing that with us? Yeah. Salvation, forgiveness, grace, mercy, love, all these things. He's cultivating us. He's preparing us to love other people, to do good things in the world, to, to help other people, to, to bring other people to Christ. Good works. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Act like you've been cultivated is what it's saying. If you don't do it, you'll die. Right? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's what it's saying. If, if you're going to bear thorns and briars after being cultivated, cultivated for these good things, you want to go back out into the world and do all the same things that the world is doing? Think of it like a light that spreads. For sure. And so <clears throat> that is why Jesus said, go and sin no more. I mean, I think Romans chapter 6 is a whole bunch of explanation and almost like a commentary of what Jesus said. Go and sin no more. Well, Jesus, come on, give me some explanation. What do you mean? go and sin no more. Don't do that anymore. Like, there's got to be something else. I think, I think if we had that statement alone, we're set. We know what we're supposed to do. Go and sin no more. Jesus left it at that. He was in a position to where he just healed that person. He can give him a whole sermon if he wants to. But go and sin no more is, that's good enough. That'll do it. Because we know uh, what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, our conscience, especially as we, uh, as we work on that conscience through constant use, we're going to know what good is from evil. And we can, we can separate those things. So Romans chapter 6, uh, we'll keep reading uh, verse 3. Or do you not know 
that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. <clears throat> okay, coming from a uh, crowd in, in 2020 where uh, many of you have probably read this passage, at this point, uh, especially as I was baptized, I was taught this, that what I was doing was recreating the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it's because we have this passage now. What about before that was written? We have the Gospels. How many different uh, <clears throat> things can you read leading up to uh, the baptism that's taught here? Uh, and would you know that you were recreating what Jesus did? That's my question. Because he says, or do you not know? As if he's mocking them for not knowing it. Okay. John's baptism. He says, <clears throat> come and repent. Am I repeating Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? Probably not yet because Jesus has not died. Right? That makes sense. Uh, what about when Jesus gives a great commission? Uh, Go therefore and uh, make disciples, uh, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Did it necessarily talk about how that was replicating his death, burial, and resurrection in that moment? I think it can be maybe implied on the back end, but I don't see it there. If I just had Matthew 28, I may not know it yet. Okay? <clears throat> uh, John's baptism was with uh, water. He says that Jesus would come after and do Holy Spirit do it with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Still am not seeing specifics on that replicating the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, <clears throat> how can he say, or do you not know? You know, why, why can he mock them? Why can he suggest that they should have already known this? I want to look at a couple passages because I find this uh, kind of interesting. Why should they have known? Luke 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his, oh, sorry, that's John 3.16, I thought I had it. <laughs> we know this one. <clears throat> Luke 3.16, John answered saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. There's that passage where uh, the baptism is going to change, but what's it going to become? <clears throat> How about Mark uh, chapter 8, verse 34 through 36? When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. Baptism is about taking up your cross, following him. You're being made in his likeness. You're participating in the same thing that he did. Didn't Jesus die to self? He made himself nothing. He made that, uh, he made that very clear. We do the same thing. We should become like nothing, take up our cross, crucify self. Uh, Paul says that he crucified himself to the world and the world to himself. What better way to, to be clear on the fact that you're not going to keep living the same lifestyle if you're no longer a part of this thing we call the world. We're a part of something uh, greater. Look at John chapter 3. This is why I had John marked, but not John 3.16. I want to talk about <clears throat> Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. Okay, this is maybe why they should have known that they're doing something more than going underwater and getting forgiveness of sins. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Something, something specific is going on here. We're being born again. That's, that in Mark chapter 8 put together, you can see we're dying to self and 
we're being born a new creature. It's completely different uh, than it was before. And so we have all of these passages. I want to look at one more. Luke chapter 14, verse 27. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That again, backing up Mark chapter 8. What does it mean to bear the cross? What does it mean to bear the cross? That's a great, uh, great question. <clears throat> When Jesus uh, is walking to Calvary, he's got the cross on his back. He's preparing himself. That means, uh, although they made him carry that cross beam, uh, he's preparing himself. He's humbly submitting. How did, he, how did he carry it? How did he do all those things? He's not lashing out against it. He didn't... He didn't uh, What's the, the, the passage that says as a, uh, as a uh, sheep goes to slaughter, is silent, so is Jesus. Okay? Uh, that's, that's Jesus. He went without a fight. He could have called all these things uh, uh, to protect himself, to save himself, but he humbly submitted, made himself as nothing. As he was going to the cross, who was he thinking about? thinking about us, thinking about uh, uh, submitting to God, obeying the Father's will. He's thinking about all those all those things. If he was thinking about himself and his well-being, <coughs> drop that cross and, and run. Uh, find some way to get out of this. When we take up our cross, we're submitting to the Father's will just like Jesus. What do you want me to do, God? Uh, how do you want me to live? All the things that were important to me, uh, pleasing man, uh, you know, doing what the crowd wants to do, doing what I want to do. All those things go away as we're carrying that cross and we're submitting to the Father. And so that's what it means to take up our cross. And so when we hit Romans 6 and Paul says, or do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Should you not have known that that's what that was for? Yeah. When you look at everything Jesus said, they should have known that. Uh, but especially now that we have it in text, now we especially know. But they should have even known it before this was written. But I'm glad it was. It makes it very clear. But it had to be known to be written. That's for sure. Uh, that is an analogy that was often used. Uh, uh, refiner's fire. They melted things back and, and got to that which was pure. And uh, that's certainly something that does happen when we're baptized. We are uh, purified uh, and cleansed of our sins. And so uh, that is a, a good analogy to go in uh, with the, the idea of baptism. Uh, for sure. Uh, let's continue reading uh, verse uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Uh, we've touched on the newness part, uh, and I want to look at a couple more passages that talk about the old versus the new. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also should be in the likeness of his resurrection. There's the, the, the positive part of this, the pro, uh, where not only are we going to die to self and uh, live for God, but there's a great reward for that. Uh, we're going to live with him. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man 
was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. If you've ever uh, <clears throat> studied some of the other religions uh, that are out there in the world, okay, uh, Buddhism, one of their big things is anti-self. They, uh, they become very disciplined uh, in, in focusing on their religion. It's anti-self, anti-self, anti-self. And they have their rewards that they say you get from that. Um, but uh, it's nothing like what is being offered here uh, with Jesus. Okay? In fact, one of the things is you, you have to do it uh, perfectly. They don't have things like grace and forgiveness with uh, Buddhism. It's actually just whatever you did, that comes back around. It's almost like it's more strict, which <clears throat> some will say if it's more strict, then it's more holy, it's more righteous. But they didn't have anyone to forgive them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have something very special mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ in that uh, if we're in the world, if we're sinners, uh, Jesus forgives us. He still hates sin. He hates sin every, every, much as, every bit as much as uh, what's taught maybe in, in Buddhism. But uh, what we have is we have forgiveness, we have grace. Uh, even after you've come to Christ, you mess up. We've talked about what you do, and you're still uh, free from guilt. And so what we have here uh, being offered in this faith is very, very special. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 5 Verse 24 says, And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Chapter 6, verse 14, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me. That's what he says. The world has been crucified to me and I to the world. He doesn't consider himself part of what everyone else is doing. This is what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Okay, back in John chapter 3, I just want to summarize kind of what he said. He goes into that part where he says, uh, if you've been born of the, the Spirit, uh, you're like the wind. It, uh, nobody knows where it's coming from or where it's going, uh, but you know it's there. right? He, he goes into that and you kind of puzzled for a second. What does that mean? Uh, someone that's born of the Spirit is like that. Uh, what, what could that possibly mean? Someone that's born of the Spirit knows that they're not a part of this world. They know exactly where they're belonging, where they're supposed to be going. And I've had conversations with people not of the faith where I can tell uh, some of the things I may say to them, what is that guy talking about? Because they don't have the same mindset. They don't have the same knowledge that we have. We know where this life is ending up. It's, it's going, we're going to heaven. Right? And, and so we know that this, this world is passing. It's fleeting. This is not our ultimate existence. And so uh, that's something that comes from being baptized into Christ. We receive his spirit. And now we understand where we are going. We know that. We're not just dying to self. That's not the end of the story. We're also going to be resurrected. Jesus didn't go into the grave and there he remains. Where is he now? He's in heaven. And so all of what we're doing is in that likeness. That's where we'll be as well. We get a new life. For sure. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. One of the covenants that God made with Abraham, uh, you may look back at it and go, why in the world? 
did God make that such a significant thing? That that was a sign of their covenant? Many people that are uh, maybe not in the faith or even in the faith might question that. Uh, you can talk about the health benefits. Uh, you can talk about uh, it was simply he found something for them to be obedient about. And you try to explain it in all these different ways. Uh, but I think this one's a, a great one. That God, even in his foreknowledge, he knew that he could take this as an example as teaching us later. That as we're baptized, we're putting away the old and we're uh, left with uh, being a part of Christ, a new creation. All of those old things are cut off, cast away, and we don't have them any anymore. Okay, Romans chapter 6 and verse 7. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also Live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'll make this my, my final passage here. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, uh, abominable idolatries, in regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. I think this is a great passage for reflecting on Romans chapter 6. It says, such were some of you. You participated in all of these same things. The, the Gentiles are the people of the world, the people that don't have a hope. They don't know where they're going. They, they were born... Uh, they uh, went to the through the school system, and uh, then they're supposed to get a job, and then you know maybe they're supposed to get married, and then uh, you want to plan for retirement, and then uh, well we just won't talk about it anymore. That's that's what's going on with the world. Have fun while you're here, because it don't last long. You know don't don't do anything disciplined. Just have. Just have fun and do whatever you want. And that's, uh, that's where uh, they, they lead themselves into lewdness, lust, drunkenness, uh, revelries, drinking parties, abominable, abominable idolatries. That's what the world is participating in because that's what they find themselves doing. They, they, can, they can do nothing but think of evil continually. They don't have time to think about greater things. Uh, that are beyond this world. That's why when we're born of the Spirit, they don't understand why you don't want to go do everything that they do. They don't understand why uh, perhaps you don't want to participate in what they're doing. They don't understand that we're thinking about something that's beyond this world. We're thinking about something that's eternal. And that's why it compares us to the wind. Where did it come from? Where is it going? Well, we know. We know where we're going, and that's what causes the change. Uh, so, <clears throat> I guess I said that would be my last passage. I gotta read Galatians six twenty or uh, two twenty. It says, "I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me." <clears throat> If we're going to walk in the light, and Paul asks the question, can we continue in sin? Paul gave us the attitude. He's been crucified. He's done this baptism that's in the likeness of Jesus Christ. He's putting away old things. That's gone. I'm going to live my life for, for Christ. We said, take up your cross. What that meant was, 
It's not about me. I am obeying the Father, doing His will. That's the attitude Jesus had going to the cross. That's the attitude we have in this life. And, and everyone says that's a, just a terrible way to live. No, it's not. No, it's not. They don't understand. They don't understand because they haven't been born of the Spirit. We know where we're going. Uh, we know what's been offered. And that is why uh, we praise Him and we're so thankful uh, for what we have. Uh, the Christian life is full of blessing. Uh, it's full of love. Uh, it's full of joy. Uh, all of these things that we have, not just after we've left the earth, uh, but we have those things now uh, because of, we're a part of something so special. Okay? Uh, so uh, can we continue in sin? He says, of course not. We've made those changes and we move forward with that. I encourage you to keep reading this. I know we're like past time, but I have to summarize and, and collect my thoughts here. <clears throat> I want you to read Romans 6. We're going to finish the second half of it next week. I couldn't even cover like one third or even one fourth of all the things that I found for this passage. Uh, it's a great passage. It leads you to a lot of other places, as you saw, uh, as I uh, constantly was going around. Uh, but look into these things. Study it for yourself. Uh, you may know that you're not supposed to keep sinning. Uh, I think our mind kind of tells us that. But there's a lot to learn along the way, and I hope you learn from that. And I hope that we can share this with other people. They think, the whole world out there thinks that once you... Have become a Christian, you're perfect at that point. The more that we can just tell them that, yeah, I messed up. I, I sinned after I was baptized, after I came to Christ. Uh, but I, I'll tell you about it. I don't want to do it anymore. I confess that to God. I confess it to everyone else, and I'm free from guilt. And if you can look somebody in the eye and, and tell them that, they're going to understand and not think you're a hypocrite that much more. And of course, you're going to be forgiven as well. And so live with those things in mind. Uh, pray about these things and uh, study it for yourself, as I always encourage. Thank you.